All right, Alexander. Um, you called it. <laughs> you called it. Uh, Quasi Quartang is out. With its yeah, Quasi Quartang is out. Liz Truss is uh, is next, I believe. Yep. Is that is that uh, how uh, that, things are going to proceed? Uh, re- regime change. Regime, regime change. change. That's, that, that's exactly what we see. That's what we're seeing in London. And yes, I think that is exactly what we're seeing. I mean. Uh, um, uh, Throughout the media reports this morning, there's been a bombard of messages that Kwarteng was about to be sacked. I'm not even sure whether Truss had that plan this morning, but the media basically told her that that was what was going to happen. The Conservative MPs were primed. The markets were made ready. There would have been an absolute crash in the markets if it had not happened. Kwarteng was summoned back from Washington to London. He met with Truss this morning in Downing Street and he's out. He's sacked. I think it's the shortest period of time anybody has ever been Chancellor in British history. But that's only the opening overture. It's only the, you know, the raising of the curtain, if you like, because we're now also getting reports that there's a group of senior Conservative MPs and ministers, and they're getting together, and early next week, by which I presume one, they mean Monday, they will be meeting Liz Truss herself, and they will be telling her to go too. And if she doesn't go, there will no doubt be a vote of no confidence. They'll, they'll have to change the rules to arrange it, but there will be a vote of no confidence forcing her to go. And there's further reports which were circulating yesterday that the successor has already been picked. I don't think we are going to be surprised that it's Rishi Sunak, billionaire globalist and all that. Um, Apparently he's in some sort of dream team, dream team, nightmare supposed to some, uh, with Penny Mordaunt. I'm not sure what job she's been given. Uh, We don't have a deputy leader system here in Britain. But anyway, it looks like the idea is... Uh, Kwarteng out today, uh, Truss out next week, um, Sunak takes over, um, uh, the new Chancellor, some speculation is going to be Syed Javid, who was uh, another orthodox globalist type, and in effect, total regime change in Britain. And it all started, the, the event that really made it clear what was happening was what I said uh, uh, that speech by Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, on Monday when he told told the pension funds that they needed to bail out of the gilts market by today. The moment that happened, the whole train of events that we're seeing now uh, basically became unstoppable. Right. Um, Putin must go. We've been hearing that a lot from the collective West. Can we say that this is in due part to the, uh, what, what we like to call the Elensky curse? You know what I mean. Yes, the fact that they well, went so all in to Ukraine, they lost sight of everything else that mattered. Can, can we chalk that up to, to the Elensky curse? Yeah, Dagi, Macron, uh, who else uh, has fallen to the, Boris Johnson, all of these people. Can, yeah. Is it safe to say that? It's absolutely so to say that. I mean, to be absolutely clear about it, if it had not been for the Alensky curse, Boris Johnson would probably still be our prime minister. It was because Boris Johnson led Britain after, frankly, a very un- chaotic period of government. I'm not, you know, quitting Johnson of anything. But the, the thing that made his position impossible was that he led Britain into this confrontation with Russia over Ukraine, which has triggered a massive economic crisis. Whatever you may think of Liz Truss and Kwarteng, and, you know, I've made my views about them very clear. I don't think Liz Truss was remotely fit to become prime minister. But, I mean, they've tried in their own incompetent, bungled way to try to find some solution to the economic crisis, which is wrecking the Conservative government, And, of course, that economic crisis is to an overwhelming extent, greater than people understand, a product of this economic war. Their solution turned out to be no solution. It was completely unacceptable to the markets. 
And of course, it opened the route for the regime change that the globalist, re-Europeanist, Remainer faction in British politics, the deep state, if you like, have always been keen on. So that's what's happened. Now, you know, Sunak, I say that, Sunak has always been, in theory, a Brexiter, but of course, um, his loyalties are to big international capital, which is where he comes from. Right. So if... Um, well, actually, two, two questions to... And we could finish the video on these, on these two questions because... Um, we talked at length about what was going on in the video we did yesterday. And, you know, like I said in the open, uh, you, you called it and, and you went into great detail as to why this is going to happen. But my, my two questions to wrap up this first part before we get into the next part, which will take place next week, which will probably be the Liz Truss uh, sacking. <laughs> yeah. Um, why did they appoint Liz Truss as prime minister? I mean, I know, I know the Conservative Party has a vote and all this stuff, but why did they push Liz Truss if they knew that she was so incompetent? Is it just because she was so hawkish towards Russia? Was that the only thing that got her the job? And to wrap up the video, Alexander, if Rishi Sunak was sitting right in front of you, what would you tell him in order to survive right. what's about to come his way, which is going to be another regime change in order to get Keir Starmer into uh, 10 Downing Street. What would you tell Rishi Sunak? I know right. that he would never listen because mm -hmm. he's a very Obama-like globalist billionaire figure. That's kind of his persona. You know, the, I, I know everything. I'm, I'm this you know, globalist, you know, worldly, worldly guy like Obama was, and he won't listen. But if he did, if he, if he did uh, uh, listen to you, what would you advise him? Yeah, right. First of all, why did why did uh, uh, Liz Truss become prime minister? I'm afraid you've put your finger exactly on it. Of all the members of the British government, apart from Boris Johnson himself, she was the most hawkish on Ukraine. I mean, she she talked about Ukraine incessantly. She went to Moscow. She had that disastrous meeting with Lavrov, which, by the way, should have disqualified her from ever becoming prime minister. But anyway, she went to. Moscow. She took on Lavrov and was eaten alive. <laughs> but anyway, she did. She's been outspoken in her support of Ukraine. That was popular with some members of the Tory party. It was also popular, of course, with the deep state. I mean, it made them feel that this is somebody that is reliable up to a point. I mean, they disregarded briefly her incompetence because, as I said, they did see her as reliable, as somebody who would hold the position until they could manoeuvre Keir Starmer into power through the mechanism of an early election. I think that was always the plan, by the way. I think that was always the intention. Um, so I think that I think that was that was that why she got in. I think there was one other factor which is difficult to quantify exactly. But it is the case that during the leadership election the Conservative leadership election. She got Boris Johnson's backing. Boris did not want Rishi Sunak Prime Minister because there's bad blood between the two. Boris uh, feels that it was Sunak who engineered his removal. So because of that, and just as a spoiler, Boris backed Truss. And Boris being Boris, it's possible he also did that because he knew that Truss would implode and thought that that would open the way back for him, which it won't, by the way. But that's, 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 it's, it all ultimately comes down to Ukraine. There's no other reason, apart from Ukraine and her stance on Ukraine. I don't think anybody knew anything about trust at all. I don't think anybody knew what her position was on anything. Remember, she was a Remainer at the time of the Brexit referendum, and then she shifted her position and became a Brexiter. So this is somebody with no very clear positions on any particular matter. People talk about her as an ideologue. I don't think she is one. But on Ukraine, she was lot reliable. They wanted somebody to back things on Ukraine. And she was the person who came through. What would I tell Sunak? 
The first thing I would tell Sunak is level with the British people. Now, the point is, and I've said this many times, the situation in the country is very bad, worse than the government, the political class is admitting. And that is creating a growing sense of cynicism and uh, disconnect between the political class and the country. And remember, that's already very wide as it is. So he first has to come, go on television, tell people in Britain, I know how bad it is. And I'm going to be 100% committed to trying to turn this thing round. And in order to turn this thing round, he needs to do what no other Western leader has done up to now. He's got to talk to Biden. He's got to talk to the European Commission, he's got to talk to Olaf Scholz, he's got to talk to Macron, and he's got to say to them, this is where it ends. This crisis over Ukraine is destroying the West. It's destroying the collective West. Britain can't take it, nor can you. We've got to find some way out. And here, this is the one thing about Sunak that I am going to say in his favour. Now, uh, you know, don't Please don't people misunderstand me. I'm no fan of Sunak at all. I think he's a sinister, manipulative, intriguing globalist. I I mean, he's not my type of person in any way. But amongst members of the British government, he's the one who's talked, one of the ones who's talked least about Ukraine. He's never shown any real enthusiasm for this conflict. He's shown some understanding of the gravity of the economic problems. So perhaps, just possibly, given the fact that you know he's been manoeuvred into power this way, basically by a, to try and get Britain out of the crisis that it's in, so to steady the ship in some way, at least that's what the Conservatives hope for. Perhaps, just possibly, he might understand that. And if he goes out and talks to Conservative MPs and to members of the Conservative Party, he can impress upon them that for their own survival as a party, they have to change course on Ukraine. Now, whether he's prepared to do that, where he'd be willing to listen to that advice, whether he's able to listen to that advice, even if he understands it and accepts it, whether, you know, the deep state would let him do that, that's an entirely different question. But that is the advice I would give him. I would, and the first thing he's got to do, the very first thing he's got to do, is he's got to talk to Biden and Yellen and tell them this oil price cap idea is stupid. Britain is not supporting it. We are not going to blow up the Lloyd's insurance market trying to do something that can't be done, which will only make oil... Sh- or the oil crisis worse and which will discredit the oil, the, the London insurance market uh, uh, for shipping and for tankers and for the transportation of oil. So that's the first thing he needs to do. Right. OK, um, I think we can leave it there, Alexander. I think we can. You know, I, I mentioned Obama because uh, there are a lot of comparisons between uh, Sunak and Obama, these globalist, neoliberal, very smooth talking, very charismatic type of characters. And uh, I was listening to you as, as you were explaining, um, you know, Sunak's position on uh, or his lack of taking up a, a bellicose position on Russia and Ukraine. And I just thought to myself, Obama, no, uh, Obama was awful as a president. But, but he had one saving grace. When it came to foreign policy, as bad as he was, as many wars as he started, he never escalated vis-a-vis Russia. Even in Syria, when they were talking about um, uh, no-fly zones and stuff like that, Obama, he, he, he went against the grain and he, and he pulled back. Because he knew that there was a certain line he couldn't cross. It would lead to a catastrophe. He did understand that. And I'm also not condoning Obama in any, in any sense, sense at all. I mean, the guy was, I think, was an awful president. 
But he did have that sense. I wonder if Rishi Sunak also has that type of of uh, of sense to him, where where he says, you know, like you said, we've taken it too far. We've yeah. taken it too far. Uh, we can't escalate anymore. We need to pull back. Absolutely. Can I just say I agree completely with you about Obama, and notice how quiet Obama has also been about Ukraine. I mean, he's not been going out making speeches over supporting Ukraine. He's not been doing photo ops with Zelensky or anything of that kind. So, you know, I think that's a very good point, by the way. Um, I don't know about Sunak. I think he's a clever man. He's a every bit as manipulative as Obama was. He even looks a bit like Obama in some ways, I find. Um, I, I think he might have that sense of reality. But I'm afraid we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, the other thing to say about Sunak is, of course, that he will certainly become prime minister if he becomes prime minister. He will certainly be a prime minister who's come in in a very unusual way. He won't have been elected by party members. He won't have won an election. He will have become to power entirely as a product of intrigue. And, of course, that would put him in a pretty weak position, I would have thought. So, you know, if if the deep state comes along and says you're not moving, changing anything on the Ukraine, you've got to send them another 20 billion pounds. Well, you know, I, 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 it's going to be very tough for him to change course, whatever he may think in private. But, you know, if he does think differently, and as I said, he's been one of the most reticent on this subject up to this point. Well, perhaps he can he can start to make those moves, which I think. He should make. By the way, if he were to make those moves, all the indications are, and I really believe this, that he would find a lot of support in the country. I think that um, I've noticed that, you know, the Ukrainian flags that you used to see in windows here are now disappearing one by one. One very big one, a few metres from my house, has just vanished. I think people are becoming tired of this thing. And I think if they felt that this is the way to right the ship, they would back him. But he's got to be very straight with the British people. And I don't know that he has that skill. I don't know that he can. Okay. We'll leave it there. The Duran.locals.com, everybody. And uh, look for us on Rockfin. And the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.